I recently had a conversation with the YouTuber The Distributist, which is a channel I highly recommend in spite of our disagreements. We discussed the future of the West in terms of how we ought to decide how issues get resolved. My preference is for a liberal society composed of a critical plurality that engage in reason and evidence-based discourse over the issues before deciding, democratically, how to incrementally adjust the parameters of society in order to acquire data on how it functions, and then responding accordingly to the consequences. The distributist, by contrast, longs for a return to a tradition-based society where it is principally the church which upholds and maintains Western society by imposing from above the standards and principles that the masses ought to subscribe to, which will not necessarily be open to discussion and debate. I've linked in the description box the hour and a half discussion that we had, along with a half hour long follow up video he made reflecting on the discussion and clarifying his thoughts and objections to my worldview. This video is basically a clarification of my own thoughts and objections to his worldview. I would like to remark beforehand, however, that this is not an attack on the distributist. I'm not saying this in order to reassure him, he already knows this. I'm saying this for the benefit of potential interlocutors into our discussion. This is not an argument, it's a dialectic. He and I are in the business of crashing our ideas against each other and leaving you, dear viewer, to pick up the pieces and perhaps craft from it an even deeper truth. Cultivating a deeper appreciation for such discourse and spreading it through the skeptosphere is a goal that both of us share. So without further ado, here's a kind of impromptu response to everything that has been said thus far. A recurring theme in the videos of the distributist is the belief that the contradictions inherent to modernity have destabilized society, that the foundations of Western civilization, which have allowed it to survive and have its memes propagate throughout the generations, have been recklessly abandoned, leaving the edifice of Western society dangling precariously over the abyss, which is inhabited by the most toxic threats to society, both internal and external. He envisions a return to a traditional society where the foundations that made the West stable are returned to their rightful place, keeping us from falling into the abyss. In such a society, it would be necessary to suppress deviation from the traditional consensus, either through coercion or public shunning, because it would have the potential to destabilize society and cause it to collapse into the abyss. The distributist is then, perhaps, like the Grand Inquisitor from the Brothers Karamazov, except instead of reluctantly constraining people's free will for the purpose of getting them into heaven, the distributist will be reluctantly constraining people's critical faculties for the purpose of keeping society from collapsing. How exactly he intends to achieve such a state of affairs, the distributist never specifies, and indeed, I suspect that his pessimism is owed largely to him suspecting that such a society will never be achieved, at least not on our terms. Perhaps on Saudi Arabia's terms, but certainly not our own. Because of time constraints, we were not really able to get into the meatier, juicier aspects of the conversation, and indeed I spent most of the time trying to clarify my own view of how society ought to address its problems without first being able to frame it with a little context. I spent no time at all attacking the distributist's vision of how society ought to be run, so I'm going to kill two birds with one stone right now by first elaborating on how I think human beings, and by extension society, function, and why my belief in how we function precludes the possibility of us ever returning to the traditional mode of thought. From there, I'll lead into how the problems posed by our natural and material conditions can potentially be addressed, before concluding with a very brief elaboration of how I conceptualize the open society. I'm going to frame my position by making the following claim, from which the entirety of my appraisal of the world follows. Our culture, and the specific features that it has, are principally the consequence of both our human nature, as understood by Hobbes and Darwin as opposed to Rousseau and Marx, and the material conditions that underlie it. The development of a civilization is inextricably linked to both the material conditions of that society, which is parameterized by both the immediate availability of natural resources and the capacity to trade with other civilizations, and human nature, which is defined in terms of our natural history and the genes that it shaped. Culture is downstream of both our intrinsic nature and the material conditions. One of these parameters has not, as yet, been open to a great deal of modulation. Human nature hasn't changed significantly in the time of written history, though with the introduction of new technologies like CRISPR-9, that could potentially change. Our material conditions, on the other hand, have changed significantly, and especially so during the Industrial Revolution. If the Marxists were right about anything, anything at all, it's that the base has an enormous impact on the superstructure.
Societal norms are largely a function of the material conditions that underlie it. Change them significantly, and societal norms will likewise change. Take a group of 17th century Brits and settle them in Jamestown, America. I don't care how much British politeness or Western civility you've been socialized with, when the untamed swampy environment fucks your crops up and makes the town go hungry, cannibalism and infanticide are going to start taking hold. I don't care how much enlightened communist re-education you've been given in order to make you love every comrade as though they were your brother. When the Nazis blockade your city of Leningrad and prevent basic rations from entering into the city for months, cannibalism and infanticide are going to take hold. I think that this is a relatively uncontroversial view. When times are rough, priorities change, and social norms get readjusted. That's just life. But I want to postulate a much more intriguing possibility. I want to suggest that when times are great and resources are abundant, the incentives that shaped traditional society cease to have as much of an influence, and the foundations of traditional society begin to erode. I do not believe it is a coincidence that the suffragettes began to envision new, non-traditional roles for women in the wake of the Industrial Revolution. I do not believe it is a coincidence that the abolitionists largely came from the North, which was the primary beneficiary of cheap industrial labor, as opposed to the South, which had a rural, agrarian economy in which enslaved farmers were a far cheaper option and for which no significant industrial advances would develop for decades. And finally, I do not believe it is a coincidence that the will for women's financial and sexual independence chiefly arose during the post-war boom and the accompanying rise of the service sector economy, as well as the development of the birth control pill. The changes in family dynamics that the distributist laments would not have been possible in a society where women still relied on men to go out and hunt for meat before giving them the opportunity to pass on their genes in exchange for a seat at the table. It is indisputably the material conditions of society that are the principal culprit for the erosion of traditional values. Now just to clarify, this is not Marxism. I do not believe in historical destiny, I do not believe in the noble savage, and I don't believe that the interaction between base and superstructure is dialectical. What I believe is that the superstructure has to have certain characteristics, those that characterize Karl Popper's open society, in order for scientific advancement, and consequently the material conditions of society, to thrive, which in turn will disincentivize people from participating in traditional norms. Where this leads, I have no idea. The process is teleonomical rather than teleological, so it doesn't culminate in any kind of utopian synthesis, and in fact potentially leads to disaster. If I were to draw a picture of the shape of history, it would not be the zigzag of Hegel's dialectical historicism, but Darwin's Tree of Life, where society goes wherever the boundary conditions allow it, and where those versions of society that are so incompatible with human nature that they decline and go extinct make up the dead ends of this tree of history. My project, and the project of the open society more generally, is to help steer society clear of these dead ends, but before I elaborate on what this entails, I want to take a moment to discuss an experiment that is really pivotal to my vision of the world, and that is the Great Mouse Utopia. The experiment took place in a box two and a half meters by two and a half meters by a meter and a half, where food, water, and nesting areas were distributed evenly and within a radially symmetric setup. Mice could enter tunnels that ran three and a half feet up the box's walls, with every eight inches of the tunnels containing portals to nesting areas. The setup had, in short, everything that a mouse community needed to thrive. Abundant food and water, a genetically healthy starting population, ideal temperature, ideal weather, and absolutely no predators. Moreover, the scientists conducting the experiment would regularly come in to clean the waste and change the material of the box in order to prevent the transmission of disease. It's important to note that even though this experiment is frequently popularized as an overpopulation experiment, the carrying capacity of the setup was 3,840, and yet the population of the mice never exceeded 2,200. At least 20% of the nesting areas were left unoccupied even at peak population, and resources were never scarce, so in reality, this experiment showed the effects of excessive material conditions. After the introduction of a sufficient number of mice to ensure healthy genetic diversity on day one, the experiment began. On day 104, the first litter was born, after an initial period of adjustment and the establishment of territories. From that point forward, the population exploded, doubling an average of every 55 days. 
It's worth noting that even though resources were evenly distributed, the births of new litters were not. Their distributions correlated strongly with the locations of the most dominant male mice, which the female mice were more naturally inclined to mate with. As ever, intrinsic nature was a non-negligible factor in the social structure. The radial distribution of resources did not produce a radial distribution of births, because nature has the first and final say. Starting at day 315, the population growth stagnated, now doubling an average of every 145 days. This was despite the plentiful resources that were available, as well as the fact that there were more mice available to breed than ever before. The stagnation in birth rates was accompanied by marked changes in behavior among both male and female mice. New mice became increasingly socially withdrawn, though would frequently lash out at other mice within their generation. A noticeable increase in scabs, chewed tails, and scar tissue was observed during this period. Sexual deviancy became increasingly common, with males mounting other males with far greater frequency, and females began taking on increasingly male-specific traits, such as defining and defending their territory, now that the males were too socially isolated to be inclined to do so themselves. This was accompanied by a decrease in maternal behavior, with nursing periods becoming significantly shorter and pups becoming increasingly neglected by their mothers. Meanwhile, a new type of male, dubbed the Beautiful Ones, spent all of their time eating, sleeping, and grooming without ever fighting other males or attempting to socialize with female mice. Even when taken out of the Great Mouse Utopia and placed in environments with healthy, fertile female mice, the Beautiful Ones simply refused to breed. They merely continued with their self-grooming, eating, and sleeping habits. They were the mice going their own way. On day 560, population growth abruptly ceased and began a steep decline. The last known conception took place on day 920. Cannibalism occasionally transpired, and virtually all female mice engaged in the maltreatment and neglect of their young. The experiment was finally terminated on day 1588 due to the extinction of the Great Mouse Utopia. Now, of course, such experiments are obviously highly contentious, but my interpretation of what happened is that the material conditions differed significantly from those which informed the natural history of the mice, incentivizing them to behave in a manner that was so contrary to their nature that they began raising their young in increasingly dysfunctional ways, making subsequent generations behave in a manner even more contrary to their nature. This cycle of increasingly destructive behavior continued until the extinction of the population. Analogously, I believe that the changes in our behavior as a consequence of material conditions that have become increasingly divorced from those that have influenced our natural history causes us to behave in a manner that is contrary to our nature. The difference being that we're not locked in a box that's divorced from the outside world and its many predators and competitors, and that power tends to be consolidated by people who have the capacity to do irreparable harm to the world. But what's essential to recognize is that the root of all of this is the change in our material conditions, and what this means for the traditionalist is that there is no going back to the good old days. The material conditions will simply not allow it. In a world where more people than ever before have an abundance of leisure and resources, it is just as impossible to return to the days where fornication and sodomy were frowned upon as it was for pre-industrial European women to participate in hookup culture. Things like feminism are neither emancipatory movements nor expressions of degeneracy. They are the mechanisms by which the terms of the social contract are renegotiated in order to stabilize the culture in the light of the changing material conditions. When this variable changes, the whole function changes, and the traditionalist is not able to do anything about it, no matter how much they want this term to stay constant. You literally have to smash up the machines and then burn the knowledge used to create them in order to create a configuration of society that resembles the good old days. It would be like M. Night Shyla Mama Lama, or whatever his name is, that movie The Village, which appears to take place in colonial America, but in reality is set in the present day in an isolated forest community that was created to mimic the good old days in order to create a simpler and supposedly better way of life. And of course, you'd have to take everything that comes with that. Extreme poverty, disease, all of that shit. And even if you could somehow have a traditional society without changing the material conditions, you would be maintaining ancient habits and combining them with modern means. There is no state of affairs in which such a configuration is stable in the long term. <laughs>
At the same time, the utopian's insistence on recreating the great mouse utopia on a human scale is based on a similarly fallacious belief, that they and they alone know which of these paths leads to a great and stable civilization, often failing to properly consider human nature in their calculations, just as the traditionalist often fails to take the changing material conditions into account in their calculations. As with evolution, tradition bestows upon us both useful features that allow us to thrive, such as the family as the unit of society, and vestigial features, like the suspicion of everything foreign. Critical discourse among an informed democracy is the mechanism by which this historical tree is navigated, removing the harmful vestiges of tradition whilst preventing the dangerous conflation between novelty and progress. The traditionalist and the utopian are joined at the hip in their flawed belief that they know what is best for society and how it ought to function, imposing by fiat a culture that may not be sustainable in the long term, and dismissing dissenters as deplorables or degenerates. The point of the open society is to allow for an ongoing critical discourse to take place where we consider this naturalized model of how society works and use it to formulate hypotheses about how we can adjust this or that variable. If our culture appears to be headed toward a historical dead end, we as an informed democracy can take note of this and agree to change track in a continuous process of conjecture and refutation. The advantages of starting from a naturalistic view and engaging in piecemeal engineering from there will, I suspect, be elaborated upon to some degree by Gary Edwards, who as a philosopher of science is in a much better position than I am to articulate them when he gets around to making his response video. Nevertheless, I want to touch upon a couple of concerns that the distributist had when it comes to this particular scheme. First, the tendency for fads to cloud our critical faculties is precisely why a critical plurality is needed to ensure that such circle jerks, when they materialized, are identified and dealt with. As Gary Edwards has said elsewhere, the marketplace of ideas isn't really a marketplace so much as it is an agora. There's more than just trading going on. I'd argue that being caught engaging in dishonest and underhanded tactics has a detrimental effect on a person's ability to convince others, even if they are correct. I think this has been borne out rather dramatically in last year's election. Being honest and honorable in the open society, in the agora of ideas, is still the best policy, because failing to do so may ultimately bite you in the ass. There is also the problem of indeterminacy of cause and effect in social science, which is another point that the distributist raised. I don't think that it's necessary for our appraisal of the world to meet the standard of physics in order for us to use this conceptual scheme. You don't need to know exactly how this equation evolves over time. Making a little adjustment, collecting data, and deducing the general shape of the resulting curve should be enough to tell us whether we are, broadly speaking, on the right track. When I call for a genuinely scientific social science, what I have in mind isn't a social science analog of physics, but a means of appraising society that is open to testing and revision in the light of new data. The conceptual scheme that I've put forward has the advantage of being dynamic enough to progress our culture in harmony with the changing material conditions, whilst still maintaining those aspects of tradition that are appropriate given the circumstances. And it is this superior dynamic of being neither too flexible nor too rigid that compels me to champion the open society.